Innocent and Executed, Soraya's Story. Hello, and welcome to the first episode in my Forgotten Females playlist of Hidden History, the channel that explores what the textbook ignores. I'm your host, Andrea Redlin. I'm an author, graphic designer in training, history buff, and an unashamed cat lover who loves to dive into the gritty details of history. I hope you do too. They're pretty interesting. Now, the Forgotten Females playlist is about, as you've probably guessed, history's women that you've likely never heard of. Everyone's heard of people like Marie Antoinette, Cleopatra, Mulan, but this playlist is devoted to the ladies who don't have quite so much fame. They deserve a chance in the spotlight, so I'm going to see that they get it. Now, history has many dark tales, and this week's episode will be about one of them. Get yourself some coffee, because it's going to be a long one. Maybe go for a walk, or do some of those chore household chores while you're listening. Now, this is a story that needs to keep being told, as it deals with an act of great evil that is still happening in the world today. Some of the topics in this story may be disturbing to some viewers. Expect descriptions of graphic violence, mentions of rape, and abuse. Listener discretion is advised. Prologue. All right, my hidden ones, come with me as we travel across the globe to ba -ba -ba -bum, a tiny Muslim village in rural Iran called Kupaye, which means at the foot of the mountain. The date is August 15th, 1986. It's almost dusk. Gathered in the village square is the entire town, about 250 people, but one individual stands out from the rest. It is a young woman of 35, her lower half buried in the dusty, sun-baked earth. Her name is Soraya Manucheri, and she is about to be executed for adultery by stoning. However, there is one detail that cannot be ignored. Soraya is completely innocent of the crime that she is accused of. How did this happen? In short, it was all a conspiracy to get rid of her so her 42-year-old husband could marry a 14-year-old girl, a conspiracy orchestrated mostly by him, but with the assistance of two town elders. The long version of this shocking and true story follows. If you haven't seen the 2008 film, The Stoning of Soraya M., it is a very good adaptation of the book by the same title, which was written by the traveling French journalist Freydan Sahedjam. The story of Soraya's execution was relayed to Sahedjam by Soraya's elderly aunt Zara, who invited the visiting journalist into her garden for tea. This broken woman, desperate to not let Soraya's sad story go untold, slowly revealed the details of the events leading to the execution of her niece, and the resulting 1990 novel became a bestseller. The film stars Jim Caviezel as Sahebjam, Shore Adashlu as Aunt Zara, and Mojan Marnot as Soraya. I am going to be using photos from the movie as visual aids, but I will be using the novel as my source material for this presentation. While descriptions of the actual stoning will be included, I will not be showing any graphic images of that event from the film, as it may be too disturbing for some viewers. Chapter 1. Soraya Soraya was born in Kupaya village in 1951. It must be said that Kupaya is not the actual name of her village, as the author decided to keep the name and location of the place a secret, like, the village that must not be named kind of like Voldemort, and that's probably for the best. As I began to read the book again for the first time in a few years, I came to the horrible realization that Soraya probably never had one pleasant day in her entire short life of 35 years. For starters, she was bullied by her future husband at the age of five for accidentally breaking his homemade kite, which was only the beginning of the abuse she would suffer all her life mostly at his hands. When Soraya was 10 years old, she was apprenticed to the Arbab, the village um, owner. He was the, the wealthy owner of the land and houses of her village. She had to work 15 hours a day with no pay, 
And as if that wasn't bad enough, the Arbab made it his habit to not only beat her, but also molest her when his wife was away. Uh, don't worry though, he got his just desserts. He was eventually jailed many years later for another crime and sentenced to be hanged, which he was. Oh, that's too bad. I, I can't even imagine how, how lonely and helpless Soraya must have felt during this time. She's being worked like a dog, beaten for the smallest offenses, and regularly molested by a man who keeps a gun in his car, and she had to put up with this crap for three long years. Ugh. When she returned to her village permanently at the age of 13, you would think Soraya would have been able, you know, been allowed to have a bit more fun, be a kid, go to school, live a normal life and tried to put her difficult time with the Arbab behind her, but no. Now that she was, at 13, considered to be a woman, it was decided that she was to be given away in marriage, but more like sold, to Ali Manucheri, a 20-year-old man, seven years older than her. And if you remember, this was the same bully who had punished her for breaking his kite all those years ago, and his reputation in the village was questionable. Boy, I don't even know how her parents came to this decision. Nonetheless, Soraya's parents basically traded her to this guy for a few cows, some land, and some rugs. I really don't understand how a 13-year-old girl can be forced into marriage in the 1960s like it's the freaking Middle Ages or something. I mean, gosh, at least when it was done in the Middle Ages, it was done because life expectancy at the time was 33. So I can at least buy their reasoning behind it, but the average life expectancy in the 60s was like 70. Hardly the time period to marry early before dying in your prime to a man you probably don't love or even like, for that matter, but it happened. And other things happened, too, that were equally unpleasant. Now, if you're thinking a wedding at age 13 was bad enough, the wedding night was even worse, because on that night, Ali, her husband, raped Soraya. Ten months later, at the age of 14, her first child was born. When she was 14, people, 14! At that age, she's lucky she didn't die in childbirth. I mean, she wasn't even fully grown up herself yet. I mean, pregnancy at that age can kill you. Can you imagine being a mother at 14? Can you imagine being married at 14? I mean, I was a teen bride too, and let me tell you, it does come with its challenges. But getting back to Soraya, over the next 13 years, eight more babies followed, two of them being stillborn. And throughout this entire time, Sarai and her children were often beaten by Ali. And at the same time, rumors were circulating that he was having an affair with another woman in the city of Kerman, 30 miles away, as well as dealing in illegal types of business. However, these were not rumors. He really was doing these things. So, by the time Sarai is 28 years old, her beauties faded from over a decade of misery, from being forced to be a, a child bride and a battered wife and a mother at a very young age. And it was also an unfortunate coincidence for her that the fall of the, the Shah, the ruler of Iran, and the rise of the Ayatollah in 1979, it kind of like instituted this new regime that allowed men to have more than one wife. And women, it kind of put them back into being second-class citizens with very few rights, so men kind of had all the rights for everything at that time, and women just basically had to do everything they were told, you know? So, Sarai's in this horrible marriage, she's got all these kids, and she tells her mother that she wants to die, as she's so unhappy, but there was nothing she could do to help her situation. And also, legally, her parents were not allowed to interfere. You know, the, so because the authority of the men was absolute as a result of this revolution. So, Ali was now spending more and more time in the city, often in the company of prostitutes. And he, then he starts badmouthing Soraya in their village behind her back. So, the villagers, they started to view Soraya in a bad light, avoid her, 
and speculate about really was she really a bad wife or not. Ali was only too happy to encourage this rumor to discredit her. Nice guy. I seriously think that he took great pleasure in tormenting other people, which is one of the more, more um, uh, most significant traits of a psychopath. I wouldn't be surprised if he actually was one. So over time, Soraya's miserable existence took away her will to defend herself against Ali's taunts, beatings, and poor treatment of her, and she gradually began to speak less and less in his presence. I guess anybody would. I mean, I think this happened because any protest on her part would have almost guaranteed, you know, getting beaten up. Then something terrible occurred. Her mother died, and she was devastated. However, as difficult as this must have been to endure, worse was still to come. Now, one day, Soraya was home alone, and her husband arrived at the house with a prostitute whom he slept with in the marriage bed. He didn't even know, he didn't even know Soraya was there, but even if he did, I'm not sure he would have cared. Like I said, I'm pretty sure he was a psychopath, because he enjoyed tormenting his wife verbally with his boasts of visiting brothels. Hold me back, my hidden ones, because I really, really want to punch this guy. I mean, seriously, how low can a person get? How can somebody be that mean to the person they're supposed to love? Now, if you're fortunate enough, my hidden ones, to be in a loving, healthy relationship, Take the time to appreciate your significant other, because many people are not that blessed. Okay, so now Soraya's mother is gone. Her husband is openly seeing prostitutes, treating her like crap. It was only Soraya's Aunt Zara who knew how miserable she was, because Soraya had basically become a recluse, shut out the outside world. Her husband kept coming home smelling like cheap perfume, which was a sign he'd been to the brothels. And around this time, Ali became friends with the village Mula, or, uh, which is also known as a holy man. And this Mula um, was not the holy man he appeared to be. Um, he was a murderer, a swindler, and also a former inmate at the prison where Ali worked. His position as a mullah was only a facade to conceal his evil character and to maintain a high and well-paid position that made him a sort of, like, leader in the town. You know, people treated him like royalty, yada, yada, ba, ba, ba. Anyway, so Soraya and her aunt Zara, they had never trusted this fake holy man, this mullah, because they could see right through him, you know. Um, many times... The mullah had tried to um, make advances towards Soraya by trying to get her alone when her husband was away, but she never took the bait. She was too smart for him. She always knew he was not the person he was pretending he was that the village thought he was. But it wasn't until he was sent by Ali to visit Soraya and de deliver a really crappy divorce proposition that she finally saw how evil he really was. He arrived at the house one day while Ali was conveniently away and explained to Soraya what her husband wanted. So, Ali had met this other woman in the city that he wanted to marry, but this woman was a 14-year-old girl. Now, Ali's terms were that if Soraya would agree to a divorce, he would leave her the house, the seven children, and a small field for growing produce, but no money. And I think I just heard one of you say, wow. Yeah, I heard ya. Stay with me, my hidden ones. It gets even worse. Be brave now. I know I had to be. So, after this fake moolah gives Soraya the news that her husband wanted to divorce her for a child, pretty much, and leave her nothing, he then propositioned her, offering to financially support her and the children in exchange for sex. But before Soraya can make any answer to either her husband's demands or the moolahs, her aunt Zara, who'd been in the next room listening to the conversation, um, made her presence known. She basically chewed the moolah a new one for his sick proposal. Zara, I love you. You definitely get the award for best badass aunt ever. So the moolah, scared off by Zara, 
fled the house, but he vowed that he would have his revenge on the headstrong old woman and her niece. So, to recap, Soraya now has two enemies that prove to be instrumental in making her execution happen. Her husband, who wants her gone so he can continue to be a happy pedophile, and this fake holy man, Mula, who just wants her to choose who wants her to choose between being his whore or watching her children starve to death. Boy, Soraya just couldn't catch a break, and she never did agree to the divorce. I think it was because she was terrified of raising seven children alone with no income. I mean, that would be enough to frighten anyone, but if that was me, you know, I would have thought almost anything was better than living with such a bad husband. I would have been like, Bye, see ya, get out of my life and take your hookers with you. Chapter 2, Ali. Now, sometime before Ali plotted to abandon Soraya, he had begun to work as a trafficker of stolen goods in the city of Kermit. Wow, that's an honorable man. You know, the city where the brothels were. Eventually, though, the police caught on to what he was doing, and they banned him from coming back. However, that didn't stop him from bragging in his village about his city exploits, one of which included an evening with a prostitute as payment for his services. Now, this is the part that really boggles me. Why was it okay for him to openly spend time with prostitutes, a fact known to everyone in the village? You know, because last time I checked, you know, if you're married and you sleep with someone else, that's adultery. Why was it okay for him to do that? But his innocent wife, who was above reproach, how the heck could she get a view, uh, accused of adultery with only the flimsiest of evidence? And, and in fact, there really was no evidence except his word against hers, and they took his. Fun. So, to continue on, one day, Ali secretly sneaks back to Kerman, that city 30 miles away, and he runs into an old friend. So, with his friend's connections, that's how Ali was able to secure a job as a prison guard. And while he was there, he plotted and he schemed with a few more of his evil friends to get a share of the fortune that had once belonged to the man who had molested Soraya as a child for three years. Remember the Arbab? So, Ali received the following things when the guy was hanged. Two houses, land, access to the village stream, and about $1,200 in cash, which was 10,000 riles. And he also got the man's car. So he got all this, and he wanted to leave Soraya nothing if she agreed to a divorce? All I can say is, wow, it's just a craptastic kind of day. So now, Ali thinks he's Mr. Big Shot, with his salary, job, powerful position, and newfound wealth, mostly as a result of his shady dealings. Things like freeing prisoners for cash, faking documents for his own gains, you know, stuff like that. So little by little, his wealth, his wealth starts to grow, and it was around this time that he had met the girl that he wanted to marry and leave, you know, leave Soraya for. And this girl's name was, was Mary. Now, Mary's father was a doctor who was incarcerated in the prison that Ali ran. With Ali thinking himself above everyone in his village, along with hating his boring life there, he just found he couldn't endure being married to Soraya anymore, a woman who was always silent, you know, she's become quiet over the years, yet she's above reproach. Well, dum-dum, what the hell did you think was going to happen to her after 20-plus years of you beating the crap out of her and making her life a living hell? Duh! So, Soraya's silence just, you know, pissed him off even more. So, he's begun to constantly taunt her with stories of his encounters at the whorehouses and his possible plans of remarrying and having more children. Because seven children just isn't enough to prove you're a real man, right? But as was her habit, Soraya made no complaint and was smart enough to never react. She knew it would just have been a waste of time since you can't fix evil people. You can't fix stupid people either. And in my opinion, Ali was both. Chapter 3, One Stone, Many Ripples As if Soraya didn't have enough hell to put up with after she was given the news that her husband wanted a divorce, her childhood friend Feruza suddenly died of pneumonia, leaving behind two children and a frantic husband whose name was Hashem. 
Now remember Hashem, because he too was a key player, but more like a pawn, in the events that led to Sarai's execution. He was Ali's cousin, in fact, a blacksmith who did a lot of miscellaneous repair work around the village. The sudden loss of his wife had stunned him. He desperately needed help with household tasks and childcare, and Sarai was asked by several people, which included her aunt, to come to his aid. Unfortunately, this was exactly the situation Ali had been waiting for, his big chance to get rid of his wife for good. All he had to do was watch, wait, and find the perfect moment to accuse her of adultery, which he knew was punishable by death. So twice a day, Saraya visited Hashem's house to cook, clean, do other chores, and her husband secretly followed her, spied on her, and he sowed the seeds of his plot in the village by way of false rumors. So it wasn't long before the village began to wonder if Saraya really was being unfaithful. However, a divorce just wasn't good enough for Ali anymore, because he finally figured out that a divorce would result in him having to pay familial support to her, something he wasn't willing to do. Now, he not only wanted Soraya out of the way, he wanted her dead. Thus, his plan for accusing her of adultery and having her convicted and sentenced to death began to take shape. It was the mullah and the village mayor that were also about to play crucial roles in getting Ali what he wanted. Um, the mullah was a master manipulator. He had both the mayor and Ali under his thumb, as well as his vendetta against Saraya for her rejection of his advances and offer of what I call whorehood. As for the mayor, who was an old friend of Zara's, he refused to listen to Zara's warnings about Ali's true intentions, even though the smart and outspoken woman had guessed exactly what was going on, which was the plot against Saraya to have her killed. So the easily manipulated mayor, he believed all the false accusations that Ali had named against his wife. Neglect, being a bad mother, a bad cook, etc. And now, a possible adulterous relationship with the recently widowed Hashem. So, he wasn't about to listen to Sarai's aunt and take heed of her warnings. Now, as for Ali, I would rather meet a stampede of scarabs rather than meet this guy. I know they say to turn the other cheek when people do bad things, but I only have four cheeks and they've all been turned. The first was when he bullied Sarai as a child. The second was when he raped her on their wedding night. The third was when he used her and their children as punching bags and cavorted with hookers during the marriage. Finally, the orchestration of her death on false charges was the last cheek. This guy gets the Jerk of the Year award in my book. Get going. Though Saraya knew of the growing plot against her, she knew she was blameless. So she really didn't care very much about it. She probably just thought everything was going to blow over, because how can an innocent woman be sentenced to death, right? I mean, <laughs> I probably would have thought the same thing. Now, it was her Aunt Zara who was worried sick and tried to warn her to be more vigilant. Soraya knew her aunt was right, but what could she possibly do to protect herself in a country where women had so few rights? In the end, however, her silence, which had become an unshakable habit by now, had overwhelmed her, so she made little move to defend herself. Later, she wished she had. I don't think it would have helped her much, though. One day, just outside of Zara's house, Zara heard loud screaming and shouting. It was the sound of Ali shouting for the entire village to hear that Saraya was a whore, had betrayed him, yada yada, and the crowd joined him in the shouting, and they surrounded the young woman, and they started hitting her. Zara untangled her niece from the fray and took Saraya back to her house, ordering Ali and the mayor to follow, determined to get to the bottom of what was going on. Once inside Zara's house, Ali kept shouting that Saraya had betrayed him with Hashem, even going so far to say that she was pregnant by the widower. Saraya, of course, denied it, violently, but it did no good. Hashem was brought in, and instead of telling the truth that Sarai had never done or said anything she shouldn't, he told the biggest lie ever and stood there and confirmed everything. He confirmed every lie that Ali had said about his wife. 
I have no way of explaining how a supposedly good man, someone who is supposed to be Soraya's friend, could do such a thing. Well, since Soraya's husband turned on her, I guess friends are fair game too. Ugh. My theory for Hashem's betrayal is that it was probably a combination of grief from his wife's death and probably brainwashing by Ali and the Moolah. Grieving people often do stupid things. Whatever. So, he lied about Soraya when questioned, claiming that she'd made advances, etc., while she and Zara basically stood there listening to him in horror, knowing it was a pack of lies, knowing that no one would believe the truth. Chapter 4. The Trial After the meeting in Zara's house, several women were sent by the mayor to stay with Zara and Soraya, possibly to prevent them from escaping the village. So, then the mayor rounded up the men in the village for a meeting, a.k.a. the trial. Now, I don't know what kind of trial doesn't have the accused present to defend themselves, but that's what happened. Basically, all the men in the village came together and discussed what had supposedly happened and unanimously decided that Soraya was guilty of adultery. Soraya's own father emerged from the meeting hall and screamed the word guilty when he came out, and that was when all hell broke loose. Chapter 6, The Execution As soon as the verdict was announced, the frenzied crowd of men set to work gathering stones, placing a guard at Zara's front door, and digging the hole in the ground that was to be, to be Soraya's exit from this world, a world that had been so cruel to her. With great difficulty and with her heart breaking, Zara was forced to lead her frightened niece to the town square where the execution would take place, escorted on all sides by armed men. As the crowd screamed insults and obscenities at this condemned woman, the order was given that her veil be removed and she be placed into the hole in the ground. And she was. Dirt was shoveled in and Soraya was soon buried up to her shoulders. She was given one last chance to say something by the mayor, but she had nothing left to say, and what good would it have done her when her fate had already been decided? Next, Soraya's father was given the chance to speak, and he basically disowns her on the spot for all the crowd to hear, and demands that they needed to get on with the execution. Nice, de nice father. And that's exactly what they did. While horrified Zara watched, Soraya's father was given the very first stones to throw, which he, he threw at his daughter with no pity. None of them found their, their target, though. Unshock unshockingly, it was Ali who drew first blood. I'm not surprised. With his stones, he hit Soraya's head, shoulders, and finally her forehead, from which streamed a torrent of blood. The crowd cheered him on, and more stones followed, but this time, they were thrown by Soraya's two eldest sons, her own children. Let that sink in for a second. For Soraya, I imagine that those were probably the most painful blows of all. For years, she's, she's you know, raised these children in poverty-like circumstances, only to be paid back like this. Pathetic. After that, the mullah finally got his turn to exact his revenge on the woman who had turned down his many advances. When he was done throwing stones, the crowd was able to sate its own lust for blood as they pelted Soraya with stone after stone until she slowly slumped to the ground, so torn up that she could barely even appear to be human. The rocks around her were spattered with blood. When she showed no signs of movement, the mullah asked if someone in the crowd could check and see if she was still alive. She was. It was then that a few members of the crowd took matters into their own hands, and they took a brick and they smashed open her head. It was over. All over. Chapter 7, The Aftermath That night, the mangled body was removed from the ground, and the village women were ordered to take it far away and leave it by the river, exposed to the elements. It had been decided by the, by the same people that had condemned her that Soraya was not allowed to be buried in the cemetery or anywhere else. Led by Zara, the group of women did as they were told. Early the next morning, Zara, as defiant of orders as ever, which I absolutely love her for, snuck out of the village to bury her niece no matter what the village elders said. You go, girl. 
However, when she reached the spot where the corpse had been left the night before, she found, and this isn't easy to say, she found that her niece's body had been completely eaten by a pack of stray dogs. They had scattered the stripped bones everywhere. All poor Zara could do was slowly gather up these last remaining fragments of her beloved Soraya, wash them in the stream, and then bury them. Two weeks later, she would meet the man who would tell Soraya's shocking story to the world, Fredon Sahibjan. He wrote the novel, and 18 years later, the film was made. The final chapter, What Can We Do to Stop Stoning? This story has weighed heavily on my mind ever since I saw the movie. What happened to Soraya was a terrible thing, a crime beyond words. For those who did this to her, I don't think there's a punishment on this world that can make up for what they did. This is the only known existing photo of the real Soraya Monacheri, which was taken when she was nine years old. I've taken some time to colorize it in order to bring it to life, as the original was black and white. Though Soraya's execution occurred in 1986, stoning is still happening in many countries today, mostly to women. I think it's important that we don't forget Soraya and we don't forget the other women who were tortured to death. No one deserves to die like this. Though the film has helped tra to raise awareness on the barbaric practice of stoning, it's up to people like us to keep that momentum going. By sharing Soraya's story with others and supporting organizations that target stoning eradication, you might be able to help save more lives. I've linked some of those organizations below if you want to help win the battle against stoning. In closing, there are many things we can take away from this presentation, but one of the most important things is that we need to keep our eyes open. If you suspect that someone is being abused, or if someone confides in you that they are, please tell someone. Likewise, if it's happening to you, don't be like Soraya and suffer in silence. You deserve better and you are worth fighting for. You really are. Well, my Hidden Ones, that's all I have for you today in this Forgotten Females episode of Hidden History. Thank you so much for listening. I know this was a heavy episode, but I really, really think it needed to be told. If you know of any forgotten females in history that aren't common knowledge, please let me know in the comments. Until then, until next time, stay hidden. This video was sponsored by Winter Moon Designs, linked below, where you will find apparel, gifts, and other hidden history merchandise. We hope you will support our channel and make it possible to create even more exciting content for your enjoyment. Thank you.